Okay, I'm gonna take one solution. Okay, the solution I'm gonna take is basically this solution over here. So capital psi x uh, in terms of x and t is gonna be equal to a plus e. Okay, and I got this i k um, x uh, plus omega t. All right, so this is really one of the solutions. Um, I can take a linear combination of the two, but you know I just want to take one and see what I get. And the probability density is given by the function. All right. Um, squared. Now I'm gonna magnitude of the function squared. Now I can do that to apply that to that. Okay, and let's see what I get. So I got a plus a plus is the coefficient. This is the wave traveling to the right. Okay, e to the i k x plus omega t. Take the magnitude and I square that. Now we know that this number, all right, is always the magnitude is always equal to what? So really, I'm just taking the magnitude of this over here. And when we do that, we see that the probability density does not depend. Okay, does not depend on x and t. Can we see that? Okay, it's just depend on a constant over here, and this leads to this idea about the particle having you know loss of information. We have lost the information of the part, uh, position, okay, and the time. Back to you know the idea of this particle roaming around in a certain place where we take the measurement, you know, the probability density gives us the probability of where the particle is. There's a complete loss of information because as you can see, you know, it's not encoded in the probability density. Okay, it does not depend on X and T. Now obviously this is consistent, okay, with the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which I did not talk about uh, right now. But the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that if we try to measure a certain quantity, Okay, there will be an uncertainty to the other quantity. Okay, so in this case, we are relating position and momentum, right? So if we want to try to measure uh, the position to a certain accuracy, we will lose accuracy in measuring the momentum. Now, I, you know, we can simply rearrange this, right? So I'll put change in x is more than equals to a certain constant, which is um, h bar divided by two, and I divide that by the change in, mom change in momentum. And what, can, what does that tell us? It tells us that, all right, as the change in p tends towards zero, okay, so remember, the momentum, the energy is well defined, there are no restrictions, the energy is well defined, that will also mean that the momentum is well defined, there are no restrictions on the momentum, so change in P tends towards zero, change in X, okay, what does it tend towards? It tends towards infinity, see? So the accuracy in measure, measuring the position, you know, it's, it's too large, it's infinity, that's why there's a complete loss of information on the position. That is the first physical subtlety that we have to handle in terms of interpreting you know, what these solutions mean. Now what's the other one? The other one is sketching the probability density function. Okay, probability density function right here. Okay, so now what I'm trying to do is that I'm gonna take both solutions. Okay, in fact I can take one, but I wanna take both solutions. So I'm taking both solutions this time and sketching the probability density. Okay, so the, the probability density of the psi, capital psi x in terms of t is going to be given by this one over here, right? So I just want to sketch this. Now I can write it as that, but you know it's that, right? And we found out it's also oscillating, see? Oh, sorry. We anticipated in all our previous lessons that a probability density function is oscillating for a free particle. These sort of particles that, you know, are not confined to certain regions. Why is that so? Because believe it or not, if you would actually sketch this equation over here, okay? equals to E. Okay, we will exclude the time factor for now, okay, because that's not important. Remember, stationary states, probability does not change. So all we need to sketch is the solutions of this uh, small psi x, okay, stationary states, remember that. Uh, all these are coming back right now. Okay, so kx plus um, a minus e to the minus i kx. Now, this looks very, wow, you know, this is, I don't know what that is, you know, we do a lot of mathematics. Honestly, I also was very shocked, okay, we got two um, e numbers, transcendental numbers to the power of imaginary, okay? But believe it or not, if we were to actually take the magnitude, okay? Now, um, do we know what the magnitude is? Yeah, it's basically, uh, there's a formula for it. I can't remember the top of my head, but if we can convert them to the trigonometry terms and then separate the imaginary, so we got the real, I think it's about two cosine, okay? Two cosine kx plus, I think there's an i, uh, two sine, I think, two sine, um, yeah, kx. And remember, how do we sketch the magnitude of this? The magnitude is given by the, the square of the real part, okay, so it's 2 cosine kx squared, okay, plus the square of this imaginary part, so it's 2 sine kx squared. Uh, yeah, the square of that, and then we take the square root, okay, and then after that we take the square of this, so basically it's just this right here. We actually get a real part, and we can sketch that real part, you see? So we can actually sketch the probability density uh, function. 
which looks very hideous to us when we observe it from, from this um, equation over here. It looks downright hideous, but we can actually sketch it. And when you sketch it, you realize that we finally get this oscillating function that we are talking about, you see? This oscillating function is actually given by the psi uh, t, capital psi t squared, or it's actually also equals to the, the small psi um, squared, okay, maintain the small psi squared because, you know, it's a stationary state. This is what we're talking about, okay? But what can we see from here? We see from here that if we were to integrate from minus infinity to infinity of the whole function, which I've given over here, is actually equal to infinity, you see? So now, what does this tell us? This tells us that there are no physical meanings for the solution, okay, of the Schrodinger equation. The physical meaning. Now, how do we get around this? Now, you actually uh, know that already, okay, and we get around this using what we call a Fourier transform, right? Uh, so, you know, what's a Fourier transform? Fourier transform is this. It's this, we think of a wave function, all right, which this is now what we call, remember, the wave packet, all right? It's the wave packet. The wave packet is the localized wave function. So, this is the wave packet. It's given by 1 divided by square root of 2 pi. We integrate that from minus infinity to infinity of another function, okay, this is what we call the amplitude of the wave packet, amplitude of the wave packet, which I actually went through all this on my previous lesson, but you know, we just want to really apply it now. Amplitude of the wave packet multiplied by one of the solutions. The solutions that we pick is the solution over here. Right? Um, sorry, my side. It's a solution over here. Pick one of the solutions, integrate that with respect to the wave number. Okay, this is what we call the wave, uh, sorry, the Fourier transform. Now, we can also, you know, get back the amplitude of the wave function by doing a similar integration, but this time integrating the, the, the solution side. So, what does this all mean? You know, taking this Fourier transform, finding solutions. Okay, now, the Brunner's hypothesis says a particle has particle-like behavior, wave-like behavior. Solving the Schrodinger equation gives us the wave-like or a wave-like equation of the particle. And we also saw a way that we can link the two, you know, find the physical meanings of the wave function and link that using all these uh, equations that we have. But the thing is that we found out that for that solution, we get something with an unphysical solution. Okay, why is that so? Because you know the, the probability density. You know, uh, it, it can't be normalized. It can't be normalized. You know, we get something like that. So you see, the thing is that. We know that this whole area, okay, is infinity. So how can I say that the probability of finding the particle here, let's just say it's um, 40, okay, and the, the probability of finding the particle here is, let's just say, 30. It does not make sense. It is unphysical. The Fourier transform is a way for us, okay, to make this physical by confining the motion of a particle in a certain classical trajectory. So when we apply the Fourier transform, when we sketch out this function over here, it will become something like that. And finally, this is what solves all these physical uh, subtleties that we have. Now, the momentum and the energy is now no longer um, well defined. We need to kind of um, sacrifice that information for us to gain information about its position. You see, it's always linked by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But have we got that? We, yes, we did. Now, if we were to divide that by a certain constant, okay, and the constant is, we, you know, find out that it's, you know, square root of 2 pi. Right? Okay? This whole area, we can conclude is 1, okay? Because now it's normalized. And now we can say that the probability of finding the par uh, particle here is given as such, and the probability of finding the particle here is given by such. Why are we allowed to do that? Because I say again, we have exploited the superposition principle. Taking all these waves, okay, make them interfere constructively at a certain region, the classical trajectory, and making them uh, interfere destructively at a certain region which is out of the classical region. Now, just uh, one last attention, okay, draw your attention to, to about this Fourier transform so we at least understand something. Now, remember I can rearrange K. K is given by um, this equation over here, right? So, if I'm integrating uh, with respect to K, I'm also kind of integrating with respect to E, the energy eigenvalues, okay? Then from the forage, uh, from the superposition principle, we realize that we can superimpose solutions to the Schrodinger equation based on the different energy eigenvalues, right? The different energy eigenvalues. And then I would also like to introduce this concept of degeneracy, okay? See, everything is coming back. Remember, degeneracy, we got a certain energy eigenvalue is associated with only one and only one wave function. So our continuous states, I think it's twofold degeneracy, okay? So we want to kind of tackle that issue some other time. But if we're integrating with respect to the wave number, we're integrating with respect to the energy eigenvalues. So what we're essentially doing is taking all these different solutions, okay, that correspond to different energy values, 
and then integrating them okay with a certain function and this function actually corresponds to the constant over here and when we do that we find this idea of really localizing the wave function and this is what we find, always call the wave packet okay the wave packet is a way to you know really represent the particle okay it has a physical meaning you know when it's confined a certain uh, classical region right so you see just one problem like that some mathematics okay for your transforms rearranging finding the solutions linear independency and once we do all that find the physical meaning okay the brothers hypothesis links the two you know complete lots of information what are we going to do apply fire transform localize the wave function get the wave packet and this is what quantum mechanics is all about okay it's not easy subject okay and this is my dear friends it's just when the potential is equal to zero and we deal with more potentials you know a lot of stuff happens okay we need to you know be ready for that all right so i hope you stick on for the next few lessons thanks